Okay, well, welcome back. And uh, you've, I really enjoyed Dr. Conor's presentation. I know many of you did too, you're still here. And some of you may have had some questions. We'll uh, have some chance, hopefully, for more interaction. But uh, I would like, as we begin this uh, portion of the segment, first of all, to tell you who I am, if we haven't had the privilege of meeting. I'm David D. Rose. I'm a physician with specialties in internal medicine and preventive medicine. I have boards in both. We, we have board certifications in America for specialties. I have especially worked over the last uh, 25 years or so in the area of clinical prevention, whether it relates to diabetes or coronary artery disease, hypertension, other risk factors. And we do deal with some cancer as well. I'm currently affiliated with Weimar Center of Health and Education in Northern California. And uh, we do have patients who come to us with cancer. We'll talk with you some about that. But what I wanted to do first is really affirm my brother and uh, the message that he gave, because there's a lot of confusion, I think, in the Adventist church as to how to merge conventional therapy and lifestyle therapy. So I want to begin with a few remarks on that. Dr. Connor will come back up after I spend a little time with you, and then we'll uh, also share some other things, both from my perspective and from Dr. Connor's. But let's uh, pray together as we begin this, uh, this segment and ask for God's guidance. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity you've given us as fellow believers to come together and look at both science and inspiration and try to discern how you're leading us, not only as individuals, but as a people. Father, as you've brought together health professionals, lay people, pastors, uh, various uh, individuals who have an interest in sharing the health message, please continue to give us greater clarity. Help us to see with divine eyesight and to know how you would have us take this material and share it with others and make a difference in lives for eternity. We thank you that we can trust you to help us to that end as we continue this presentation, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the questions that uh, may have come to some of your minds is, is surgery a uh, process that has God's blessing? Now, some of you might say, that's a stupid question. Why are you asking it? I'm just telling you. I deal with many Seventh-day Adventists, and they think surgery is not an appropriate therapy, that God doesn't have his blessing on this. I think of a patient I saw shortly after I finished my internal medicine residency. I learned her story. Several years before I met her, she had come to one of our natural lifestyle centers. She had actually come to Wildwood, where I was working at the time. And several years before, she had been diagnosed with breast cancer. It was at an early stage. It was confined to the breast. And the doctors at Wildwood had recommended that she have the cancer removed. They had recommended surgery. Now, I don't know how it sounds to you, but to me it sounds much more spiritual and it sounds much more uh, evident of God's power just to say, I'm not going to do surgery, I'm just going to trust God and do natural remedies. Doesn't that sound much more spiritual? I mean, it sounds that way. And, and it, it, it's so, when, you, when you're early in a diagnosis, it sounds, well, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. So this woman refused surgery, and uh, she did all the natural things. She'd heard the stories about people who'd done their natural therapies for breast cancer. But now remember, I didn't meet her at the time of her diagnosis. I met her several years later when she came back to Wildwood. Would any of you like to guess why she came back? She came back for surgery. But the tragedy is she came back for surgery because now her breast was a eroded mass. It was, the, the cancer had eaten through her breast. It had eaten into her bones. Now she had metastatic, what we would say was not a treatable condition. This was 25 years ago. And now she wanted a more aggressive surgery 
when it couldn't even cure her. And I thought that was especially tragic. And this is the dynamic that we deal with with people. When early in diagnosis, they hear these stories about the wonders of natural therapies. And I'm a great supporter of natural therapies. But this does not mean that we neglect other therapies that God has endorsed. And I just want to remind you, if you don't have this background, that God has his blessing on surgery. Surgery is part of God's plan for remedies in his healing system. This is one of the statements in the spirit of prophecy from the book Medical Ministry, page 26. And there Ellen White makes it very clear. She says, sanitariums are needed in which successful medical and surgical work can be done. Those institutions conducted in accordance with the will of God would remove prejudice and call our work into favorable notice. Now at Weimar, we don't yet have surgery. And I say we don't yet because Dr. Nedley has read this council. He's our, our president there. He's been the president at Weimar for the last four years. And one of his long-term goals is that we would have surgical capacities at Weimar. But I'm just trying to remind you that whether we speak about cancer or we speak about other conditions, sometimes the very best therapy is a surgical therapy. And there's even biblical examples of this if you think about it. As much as God seeks to be redemptive, there comes a time sometimes in the Bible where whole races had to be cut out. You remember the Amalekites in the promised land. They had to be removed. They had to be cut out. And whether you think that's a good analogy of surgery or not, the point is God has endorsed this particular uh, line of therapy. But it's interesting in that statement in Medical Ministry 26, she doesn't stop with just speaking about medical and surgical therapies. She focuses us on something that I've been encouraged to see has been a focus at this conference. It's not just focusing on the medical techniques. She says the highest aim of the workers in these institutions is to be the spiritual health of the patients or to the patients. Successful evangelistic work can be done in conjunction with medical missionary work. It is as these lines of work are united that we may expect to gather the most precious fruit for the Lord. So God is calling us to work together for surgeons to work with preventive medicine physicians and for medical workers to work with ministers and with lay people. This is the vision we've been hearing here. It's God's vision. It's a biblical vision, and it's endorsed by the spirit of prophecy. Well, some of you may have been worried about radiation, hearing about radiation here as a cancer treatment. Well, there's an interesting chapter in the book Second Selected Messages where Ellen White speaks about some treatments that uh, have been undervalued, things that sometimes have been cast to the side by various uh, workers over the years. Now, Ellen White, of course, didn't write Second Selected Messages as a book. It's a collection of things that she wrote. And here's a letter that she wrote to her son. And in this letter, she's describing her own application of radiation therapy. She said, for several weeks, I took treatment with the x-ray for the black spot that was on my forehead. In all, I took 23 treatments, and these succeeded in entirely removing the mark. For this, I am very grateful. So it appears that Ellen White, some people have speculated maybe she had a melanoma. And you might say, well, today we would have cut that out, um, whatever the case might be. She didn't see some objection to use radiation therapy in what might have been a cancer. Well, one other thing that's a, a confusing topic that Dr. Connor alluded to, you may not have made this connection, but after I leave here, uh, provided the Lord blesses, I'm speaking in some other places in Europe, and uh, one of the groups that I'm speaking for said there's a lot of interest in our community in this subject among the Seventh-day Adventists. And the subject is with vaccinations. Um, I think this is worth mentioning because whether you realize it or not, Dr. Connor had actually mentioned some cancers that are vaccine preventable. Are you aware of this? He mentioned the connection with hepatitis and uh, liver cancer. 
in talking about some of the underlying causes of cancer. Hepatitis B uh, throughout the world is actually a leading cause of hepatic cancer and liver failure. It is actually a preventable cancer. Vaccination can prevent hepatitis B. Another vaccine preventable cancer, largely vaccine preventable, is now cervical cancer. Many cases, or we could say most cases of cervical cancer are linked to the human papillomavirus. And the human papillomavirus, at least many of the uh, types, the, the serotypes of that virus, uh, we have a vaccine for. But in many Adventist circles, uh, vaccines are being disparaged. They're being uh, said to be uh, unnatural therapy. Uh, I think we could even question that because uh, what vaccines do, if you understand how a vaccine works, it exposes you to small amounts or a portion of a virus, typically, so that your body can develop immunity without developing the infection. And I just wanted to show you, again, from Second Selected Messages, uh, the answer, the best answer we can get from Ellen White's writings about vaccinations, because she actually never wrote about it. We just know about her experience. D.E. Robinson was one of Ellen White's secretaries. And in 1931, in answering a question, he uh, described her practice about vaccination. Let's just read what he wrote. He said, you ask for definite and concise information regarding what Sister White wrote about vaccination and serum. This question can be answered very briefly, for so far as we have any record, she did not refer to them in any of her writings. You will be interested to know, however, that at a time when there was an epidemic of smallpox in the vicinity, she herself was vaccinated and urged her helpers, those connected with her, to be vaccinated. In taking, now, now he's speculating, I think, because uh, he's, he's taking some editorial license as to what we should conclude, but I think this is, is warranted. In taking this step, Sister White recognized the fact that it, it, it has either been proven that vaccination either renders one immune from smallpox or greatly lightens its effects if one does come down with it. She also recognized the danger of their exposing others if they failed to take this precaution. And again, that's from Second Selected Messages, page 303. So I thought it would be helpful for us just to talk about a few of these things because sometimes we want to make this discussion very black and white, and we want to say surgery, radiation, vaccinations, they're all over there, natural therapies, lifestyles, all over there. And I'd like to suggest to you, even though the spirit of prophecy doesn't speak to these uh, things at length, there's evidence in her writings that she endorsed a much broader process. Let me ask you a question, and one of the reasons I do this for you is what would happen if all of us were more tolerant in working with our brothers and sisters who may have different expertise than we do? What do you think would happen? Have you noticed that sometimes when people get excited about the counsel we have about healthful living, they become more and more narrow in their perspective and less and less able to work with one another? This is not what God is interested in. God wants us to have high standards. God wants us to have the highest standards, but he also wants us to work together. With that in mind, as we speak about some of these topics, and even as we speak about working together, I wanted to give you a few other balancing statements from the spirit of prophecy. Now, granted, this is from the book Education, but it's perhaps one of the most powerful principles we can talk about. And Dr. Connor and I both will be building on this theme as we continue our dialogue in this workshop. In the book Education, page 296, Ellen White expressed it this way, something better is the watchword of education, the law of all true living. Whatever Christ asks us to renounce, he offers in its stead something better. Do you know what? As a physician, I've noticed something amazing. My patients never get upset if I offer them something better. If someone came into this room and they said, we have a huge problem at this hotel, we have too many, um, do they have a 10 krona piece here? 10, is 10 krones or whatever they call it. They said, we have too many of them. 
and uh, we've got to get rid of them. And we want to give you as many of these 10 as kronas as you can carry. How many of you would be willing to help them and just fill your pockets up with these and fill your hands full? Would you be willing to do that to help out here? Okay, you, you say there'd be some benefits too. So after they give you all these 10 krona pieces and your pockets are filled, then someone else comes and they said, I have a terrible problem. Uh, my father owned a, a gold mine in South Africa and uh, he willed me all this gold, but I had to get rid of uh, uh, half of it within the first week that I inherited it in order to keep it. So I've got all this gold here. How many of you would be, can I give you some gold? How many of you would say, oh, I would love to get some of that gold, but my hands and my pockets are all filled with 10 krona pieces. How many of you would say that? <laughs> what would you say? You'd say, oh, this is something better. And you'd just, you'd throw away, I mean, we'd find all this money laying on the floor, wouldn't we? Because you'd want to help and take so much of that gold with you. Why I share that analogy with you is because if we're presenting the health message as something better, people are not going to oppose you. If you present it in a winsome way and show these connections, someone's not going to get upset with you and say, I'm so angry that you told us how to prevent cancer. I'm so disappointed because now I feel like I can't eat my favorite food anymore. No, they won't say that. Now, they may, they, they may have some emotional conflict, but most people will actually be thankful that you're trying to help them. If you're helping them to see, you're not condemning them, you're showing them something better. Are you following along with me? One other statement for you. Councils on Health, page, 520, uh, page 27. Councils on Health, page 27. She says, my brethren and sisters, in your ministry, come close to the people. Come close to the people. So if people see that you're interested in them, that you're trying to bless them, if you're in a church, and this is true, I'll tell you a true story. I was in a church. The pastor invited me to speak there. He was unwilling to have any health teaching in his church for many years because he said there was a church member that always wanted to speak about health. And whenever she got up to speak about health, she, the people started walking out because it was making them feel guilty and condemning them and telling them how bad they were doing. She was not coming close to the people, do you see? So if we come close to the people, and look what she says. She says, uplift those who are cast down, treat of calamities as disguised blessings of woes as mercies, work in a way that will cause hope to spring up in the place of despair. Well, you heard Dr. Connor's story about the woman with the, the breast cancer gene. I want to tell you a related story, although it's an example about diabetes. I've worked at a number of lifestyle centers over the years, and uh, in one of the centers I was at, we had two patients at the same time who were there with the very same story. And it made a vivid impression on my mind. These were two women in their 70s. Both of them had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes from a very early age. Here's what was so remarkable about both of these ladies. Both of them had outlived all their family members. Now, as I thought about these two ladies, they had had to make changes in their lifestyle because of their diabetes. I could imagine in my mind how they were at parties as they were growing up, and others were eating cake and ice cream and drinking lots of soda pop, and these two girls in different places in the country, they were saying, oh, poor sister, she can't eat all these good foods, she has diabetes. But what happened? The diabetes was a calamity. It was not something good, but it was a disguised blessing because she got serious about a lifestyle message and changed her lifestyle. What we just heard from Dr. Connor was another story about a woman who had learned a, about a calamity, something that was saddening. It was a woeful experience to hear that she had a gene that was predisposing her to breast cancer. But as they were in that lecture, and as Dr. Connor has continued his research, what we're seeing is these things can be 
blessings in disguise. They can be opportunities to awaken people's attention to the power of lifestyle. So this is where we want to go in this portion of the presentation. We want to look at some of the things that science is showing us has power to prevent cancer. And we're actually going to find, and you've heard already some, about how these very same things can be part of the treatment process for cancer. So with that kind of reinforcement, I want to have uh, Dr. Conor come back up. He's going to share some of these lifestyle principles. And then depending on uh, how much time, I might have some more thoughts to share with you as well. OK, let's go through this very quickly, and we get into this. They talk about body fitness, physical activity, energy-dense food, plant food, animal food, alcohol, salt and prevention, dietary supplements. And they have <coughs> two advisors for breastfeeding. And we can talk about cancer survivors. Now, only facts. Why is it so important to have proof? We talked about this. Now, what is interesting in these recommendations for, especially for cancer uh, uh, <coughs> specialists, is that these recommendations, we, we know that what we do to our body, or what we don't do to our body, has tremendous impact on our cancer risk. Everybody would say okay to this. But what happens after the diagnosis of cancer? And this is the point. These recommendations, these lifestyle changes have an impact, a proven impact, in your risk of relapse and re-cancer. So even if you have been diagnosed with cancer, these recommendations apply to you. And this is something new for us. To know that it's worthwhile. So if you are to embark a patient that trusts you in a kind of tremendous lifestyle change. You ask him to do exercise he didn't get used to. You should ask him to change his diet, to, to eat something that he thought was only for rabbits. And you, you come up to him and say, well, this is what you're going to do to help uh, get rid of the cancer, <clears throat> you might be sure that what you are advising is evidence-based. And we need this proof also to get through all these uh, testimonies and all these advisors that we can find on the media that are c completely out of proven uh, ways. And we need this uh, proof to get our medical stuff in, in this perspective, in this ambition, to get our words, especially a surgical word, uh, take heed of these councils. This is something very difficult. Now I have a team. We have uh, lots of, uh, of uh, surgeons. And you know surgeons are difficult people. Right? So uh, to convince them, you need pretty good arguments. Now, why do we have difficulties to get real studies in there? Now, just to tell you, to have a study in itself is difficult. But to have studies that are blinded and th that you can, you, that could uh, <clears throat> uh, use to have a real scientific backup are difficult to obtain. You know that these studies are the best when, you, then they are, when they are blinded. This means that you give a medication to one patient and give another medication to another, and neither him nor you know what you're giving. This is the best way, best way to see what medication or what treatment is the best. Now, the problem that you can't disguise a donut for an apple, can you? This is the problem. So. As soon, the second problem is, is as soon as the people know what you are offering, and you tell them, we're going to have a trial. 
In this trial, we're going to have to randomize. So they're going to tell you what, random, random what? And we're going to have to randomize you. You're going to flip a coin. Heads, you do nothing, as did David Ornish. And tails, you're going to engage in a very, uh, in a lifestyle program with uh, surveillance that will be strict. Now these people that are interested in are going to tell you, oh, okay, I'm going to participate in your study, but I, I don't want to do nothing. I, I, would, I would take the lifestyle thing. That would be good for me. Okay, so this is the, the situations we can come in when we want to have some data and, and, and experiments within our wards. Now, the message that comes down these 10 recommendations is clear. And this is something powerful. The conclusion is that one third, one third of most common cancers could be prevented through these three items weight management, physical activity, and diet. Now, I don't know how it sounds to you, but to a surgeon, this sounds crazy. Through these very simple lifestyle changes, we could eradicate one third of the common causes of cancer. It's hard to believe, is it? The second message, take home message, that these recommendation gives us is that we have the power to reduce our cancer risk. And this is the goal that we, we should propose to people that have full, their, their, their pocket full of Crohn's. Okay? This is the message. We have the power, you and I have the power to reduce our cancer risk. Oh, I'm not saying you have the power to heal your cancer. We say that there is a risk and we have the power to reduce this risk. Okay? Okay. I call this uh, recommendation zero because we're not going to talk about this. <clears throat> we haven't got the time. This is evident. You know all about this. The only thing that I would bring up is that we as a church, now, I happen to, to be very involved in, in youth, uh, uh, in, youth uh, in, in the church, and we know that the problem is not knowledge. Everybody knows that tobacco is wrong and, 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 and bad for our health. You know that, at least in France, the medical profession that smokes the most is what? Guess? Medical. Physicians. So, and that, it's, uh, th that is why we as a country are always read on the maps, cancer maps, okay? Now, knowledge is not the problem. We haven't addressed, especially for our young people within our church, the real problem. Because starting smoke to smoke is not a problem of cigarettes. I don't know any young or anybody that has loved, has liked, the tobacco at first time. It's disgusting. The main reason why young people start to smoke is peer pressure. Period. And we haven't addressed this at all in our ways, in our minds, and in our way to treat and to address the tobacco program within and without, in, in outside our church. Okay, let's go. First, be as lean as possible within the normal range of body weight. Avoid weight gain, increase, uh, in, uh, increase of waist circumference. Now this is, the conclusion of this is maintenance of a healthy weight throughout life may be one of the most important ways to protect against blood pressure. Okay, no problem, I know this against uh, heart disease. I know this. About, we're talking about cancer. Now, I have never heard of this in medical school. Did you? And they came up with evidence. Now we're gonna go very rapidly through this. 
There's many, plenty of evidence. Colon cancer, uh, 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 survival rate that is strictly linked to uh, BMI. You know what BMI is, okay? Body mass index, okay? So over 35, the overall survival rate goes down. And it comes down not only to the overall survival rate due to other illnesses, but it's proven also for all the cases that are deaf, that are due to cancer. Um, let's go quickly. A huge study, North Health study, that shows us that not only the BME before the diagnosis of breast cancer has uh, an impact of the survival, but also the weight gain, that weight that you gain after your treatment. This means that the relapse late rate of breast cancer is linked to the weight that you gain after the diagnosis and the treatment. Okay? Are you with me, Nick? So there are plenty of evidence in these trials to see that the increased risk of cancer death, we're talking about death, cancer death, would be evaluated um, for, uh, at more than 50% for a BMA above 30 in women and about 30% in men. This is powerful and this is frightening. Now how would the way, weight uh, play a role in cancer, in, 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 in cancer? Uh, <clears throat> now increased, first, the first link is estrogen for all the cancer related, the uh, uh, hormone related cancers, there's evidence that uh, obesity and uh, uh, plays a role as a major factor, risk, uh, risk factor. Um, you know that this is especially true for postmenopausal women. You know that when ovarian stops to produce estrogen, it is the body fat that takes over. So the more body fat you have, the more you have estrogen that can foster your estrogen-dependent cancer. Another root is IGF, inflammation. We've shown in our fundamentals that inflammation causes uh, and is a great risk factor for this. Abdominal obesity. Now, this is bad news for every one of you who struggles like me with my belly. Now. Waist circumference is an independent risk factor for colon cancer. This has been proven. This is significant. It means beyond the zero, zero, 001 point. Okay? So it seems that the, uh, the proportion of uh, body fatness plays uh, a role also. David, has to, do you have anything to? To favor this? Okay. Be physically active, 30 minutes a day. Now you have to at least perspire a little bit, yes? Or be out of breath and make it a daily habit and limit sedentary habits. Now this comes very evident. All forms of physical activity have a direct impact on your cancer risk factor. Many studies for this, to Howard Center, uh, <clears throat> reduction of bowel cancer up to 50% for those with the highest, this is an observational study. Um, Melbourne <clears throat> study to lots of people with colorectal cancer and they looked at how they did on a five year survival rate uh, according to exercises or non-exercises. And the results are clear with 14% difference of five year survival rate, all death included, and 12% taking only the cancer death. So this is also evidence. And the recommendation is exercise improve, improves physical and psychological function of patients with cancer. <clears throat> 
and <clears throat> they have to gain all the way. How does it? How is it linked to uh, uh, cancer? Well, body fatness and body weight, we've seen this. Estrogen levels in the blood are reduced by exercise, so exercise can uh, reduce estrogen in our blood. Decrease of bowel transit time, the carcinogens are less time in contact with our bowel mucosa. And IGF is also uh, drops with exercise. Now, third, dietary. Limit consumptions of energy-dense food. Avoid sugary drinks. Avoid fat, fast food. Avoid processed food. Processed food tends to be more energy-dense and has all the bad things in it. I will see this. Now, energy-dense foods are uh, these that have more than 250 kilocalories per, per gram, and processed food seems to accumulate, to accumulate all these things. The processed food is added sugar, low fiber, and high in fat. Now, interestingly, interestingly um, they are natural energy-dense food. They apparently do not have the same impact and even uh, inverse impact on our diet. Fast food, you see, and sugary drinks, this is evidence we won't stay with this. Now, what is interesting is that you, we have diet, exercise, and weight control as the three uh, risk factors uh, that we can work on to reduce our cancer risk. We've seen that diet itself goes directly, uh, is linked directly to, to our cancer risk, exercise too, but these two are linked also to weight control. So we've seen that after tobacco, overweight, and this is something new, overweight is the second highest risk factor for cancer. So we might really uh, take hold of all the possibilities we have to get this weight under control. Now, let's look at the epidemics that we face today. We've seen that we have a real cancer epidemic. But uh, we also face an obesity epidemic, and David knows much more about this than I do. But I was surprised to see that the epidemic of obesity, you see the, the map on, the, on, your, on your right, matches really with our cancer map, does it? We would, like, we would say that it's almost the same, is it? Okay? So, Dr. Schreiber looked at it, and he analyzed these two epidemics, and came up with two major changes in our diet that can be historically dated to the late 40s, which means after World War II. And he tells us that the, the changes in our diet that can uh, be some explanation for our twofold epidemics, obesity and cancer, would be first addition in large quantities of highly refined sugar, leading to a higher glycemic index and rise of insulin levels. And we've seen lots and lots of times that IGF is a major inflammation uh, factor, promotes uh, uh, cancer. And the second would be the dietary imbalance ratio of unsaturated acids and fats. Now this, you might know this much more than I do, but I was surprised to see this rise in, in sugar consumption uh, that I've seen in, in two papers uh, after, uh, in the time after, after World War II. Now this is two bags, two 72 bags. This is the quantity now an American actually uses per year. Not bad, is it? So, there's plenty of evidence that sugar consumption and glycemic index is directly uh, related to cancer risk. The biggest uh, study 
is that of the Women's Health Initiative study. Long follow-up, lots of people, so this is a real study we can rely on. So these people were followed up before they had their uh, cancer, six years before, and they were scrutinized afterward. Uh, afterwards, they had developed, diagnosed their cancer, and they looked up what was the risk of getting uh, their breast cancer according to high versus low insulin level factors at the baseline that were measured before they get their cancer. Are you with me? So they found a twofold increased risk of getting breast cancer only uh, uh, according to uh, their high or low insulin level at baseline. And they concluded that refined sugar lead to higher insulin levels, overproduction of IGF, and so on, what we've seen several times before. So they can come up with the conclusion that people who want really to protect themselves from getting cancer really should, seriously should reduce their sugar consumption and their consumption of bleached flour, okay? Now, just to tell you, what does sugar really do to cancer? Now, there's some idea that cancer really feeds the, the cancer cell. This is true in its impact, we've seen this, but this is not really true in the biology and physiology. Now this, comes, this idea comes from the fact that we have now uh, image te techniques like PET scan that use glucose that is with a radi radio isotope to, um, to show uh, ca cancer or tumors uh, in our body. But actually, sugar doesn't really f make cancer grow faster. And it doesn't, uh, uh, neither, uh, if we, we starve, we can starve our uh, 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 cancer cell by not giving sugar. Now, this means, doesn't mean we've seen it together that sugar is really a risk factor generally for cancer. Now, the second uh, cause for our, our, our diet that causes uh, <coughs> cancer risk is this famous balance between omega-3 and omega-6. Now, we know that omega-3 and unsaturated, unsaturated fat are good. You stop me, uh, uh, David, if you have something to say about this. And Dr. Schreiber, uh, it turns out that our balance on six and, and three omegas is in favor of six. And you know that omega-6 is a pro-inflammatory agent, whereas omega-3 are anti-inflammatory agents. Now, I, I'm oversimplifying this. Now, why have we a bad balance of omega-3 and omega-6? First reason is that that what we eat has a false or negative balance of omega-3 and omega-6. Now, we've passed in the last uh, 60 years um, after World War II from a grass, free range grass feeding uh, cattle to battery farming with corn and soy diet. Now, it happens that grass green grass has a lot of omega in it, omega-3 in it, whereas corn and soy have little omega-3 and a lot of omega-6. So the message is here that we are what we eat. We knew that before. But we are what we eat eats. So being essential unsaturated acids, which means, you know that, that we don't produce omega-3 or 6, but we take them from the food we're eating. So our balance, our omega-3 and 6 balance, depends on the omega-3 and 6 balance of the food that we intake. The second reason is that we are just overwhelmed with what we call trans fat. You know what this and I was surprised when I looked it up a little bit for what kind of, all kinds of uh, foods 
that are in our daily uh, <coughs> regimen and our daily cooking that are just blocked up with trans fats. This is something that, that you can find in any kitchen of us. Now, trans fats have, have proven to be directly linked the consumption to breast cancer. And uh, you know that trans fat are hydro hydrogenated, and these fats are difficult to digest <coughs> and cause this rapid imbalance of omega-6 and omega-3. Plant food. Now, the recommendations eat five non starch vegetables and fruits every day. This is something that we know that we heard in the radio and everywhere. Eat unprocessed cereals and pulses. Now the good cereals that we eat in the morning, if they are processed, they have plenty of omega-6 in it. Too bad. They look good, they are, they are crunchy. We, when you, you take them in your mouth, you, you think that you have to something good for your health. <clears throat> The only cereals that are not unprocessed are muesli and this kind of cereals. So they take even that from us. Let me to find now. Uh, I was impressed by Dr. Bolivo's study. Now this is somebody who has a laboratory in Montreal and who has dedicated all his studies in finding out was what biochemicals of anti-cancer food do and how they work to lower the risk of cancer. Now we're talking about plant food. Now Dr. Beliveau said that he found anti-cancer agents only in plant food. Now he said that. And he tells us very wisely that everything is in balance. How can food interact with cancer risk? And how can food protect or foster cancer? Now he tells us that we are doing, are having cancer within our bodies every day. We've seen this in our fundamentals. It needs a lot of mutation, but we have mutations all over our cells every single day. You and I, we have cancer every day. But our body has our immune system and everything that it holds has the capacity to stop it. And not letting the cancer cell get to a malignant tumor uh, that we will have to deal with. Now, when we have, we have all these microtumors in us, and we, according to the food that we intake, will have the balance go that or this way. This means that if we take in anti-cancer food that contains biochemical agents that fight the cancer progressions in our cells, then we will lift up uh, or, or enforce the apoptosis and all the, the mechanism that our natural cells has to fight cancer. If we can, uh, take in the other food, the pro-cancer food, and we've seen a lot of them, omega-6 fats and sugar and everything, then we foster the, the soil that makes cancer progress in our body. Now this is evidence, and we, we can just deny it. But I, I like the way it's presented as a balance, okay? Now what did he do? Beliveau found anti-cancer agents only in vegetables and fruits. Too bad, that's what he said. So what did he do? He made a vegetable cocktail, a vegetable cocktail and try to, yes, he put on broccoli, uh, green tea, and everything in it. 
all the elements, all the food that he found proven anti-cancer agent in it. And he took some nude mice. Nude mice, you know that these mice have, uh, have a genetic flaw, they have no fur, and they have no immune system. This means that if you inject any cancer cell, they will in, in uh, hours and, and days develop a huge tumor. Now they injected under the skin lung cancer cells. And a normal a mice, nude mice, develops within days a tumor that makes about 5% of its body weight, which me would mean about a five kilo tumor for a human. Okay. Now they injected these lung cancer cells under, and then they looked at. This is an ob observational study, is it? Okay. So they looked up what happened. Simple. All these mice that had these vegetable cocktails did better than the other ones that died very quickly. Now listen to me. They all died, did they? Okay. But the cancer in these immune, immune deficient mice uh, progressed very much slower, not very much, much slower than the mice that had not this vegetable cocktail. Okay? This is all we can say about this. But this is impressive data. Okay, the anti cancer diet is a cancer a diet that is based, that's plant food based. This is evidence that comes up. The meat and the egg are optional, but they are not the main dish, which in Europe at least is quite different. If you have a good dish presented, you have in the middle the meat, and just around a little vegetable. Is it here too, this way? At least in France it is. So this is a major change that we asked to do in the view of cancer prevention. So we have lots of food that have proven to contain anti-cancer agents, okay? And uh, uh, well, we won't list them here, you know them better than I, but it is impressive to see that food that we take in three times a day may have an impact on cancer progression within our body. Now this is a medication that we take and that will have an, an impact in various ways because these anti-cancer agents are of different, uh, have different actions even within one vegetable. So we're taking in some kind of medicine that acts in different ways to protect us and to, to, slow down, to slow down our cancer progressions. Now I have good news for you. This is soothe to your soul, is it? Black chocolate has also anti-cancer agents in it. Well, I'm kidding you. Okay. Now, what are we doing with food? Detoxifying calcogenic substance, supporting the immune system, we've talked about it, blocking the development of new vessels needed. In green tea, we have angiotatin-like uh, elements. We're preventing tumors from creating inflammation. We've talked about inflammation and blocking the mechanisms that would enable them to invade neighboring tissues. This all is contained in simple bio uh, biological and agents that we can find in all these foods and all these that we listed. This is pretty impressive. Five, limit intake of red meat, avoid processed meat. So the conclusion is eating less meat allows the benefit for protecting for eating plant foods. Now this is a diplomatic way to say that the only protective 
agent that we can find are in plant foods. And then we have nothing to hope of from me. Now, this is not me that's saying. This is evidence-based medicine. Okay? So we have, and you know this data, evidence between, uh, of links between meat and colon cancer. This is old data that we have in your till, uh, till now, but it is there. You have this epic investigation that is a huge European investigation with 25,000 people that clearly shows us that colon cancer is directly linked to meat intake, but it shows us also that if we take fibers within our meat, that the impact, the increased risk, cancer risk, is lowered by concomitant fiber intake. Um, <clears throat> and we could go on with the, uh, the Illinois study that shows uh, a link between meat consumption and ovarian cancer. Now, it's not only the meat itself, and you know this, that counts that the preparation, the way we prepare the meat counts too. And you know that all these agents that we come up with on our meat, uh, in barbecuing, pan frying, or smoking meat, just uh, make it more harmful to our bodies. Now this is common data, you know this. So we're gonna go. Now is there, and I'm, I'm asking my expert, is there any way we could eat meat properly? Now David, I'm not talking about burgers. Yeah? I'm talking about haute cuisine française. Yeah, okay? <laughs> good, uh, good, grass-fed, uh, rich in omega-3, uh, uh, very lean, without fat meat. Can I eat it? I like his, I like, I love his response. I love it. He, he, he said, there's something better. I love it. This is the way they, and this is the way all these data suggest. There is something even better, even if it, if it is French cooking. Okay, let's go on. Alcohol, let's get down to the, the conclusion. If we take cancer only, there is no, there's evidence that even small amount of alcoholic drinks represent a major risk factor for cancer. Now, get me right. I'm talking about cancer. I'm not talking about heart, stro uh, heart stroke and, 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 and all the heart disease, okay? If you can take cancer, there is plenty of evidence that even a glass of wine, of alcohol, of everything you, need, you want with alcohol in it, is harmful. Salt, we talked about this already. Well, salt also has dying link and uh, preservation, aflatoxins, you know that aflatoxins are linked to liver cancer, especially in uh, third world countries. This is a real uh, problem, uh, especially in, uh, in, in countries where preservation is not guaranteed. But if you live around the Mediterranean Sea, you might uh, be careful of what kind of cereals and seeds you, you, are, you are eating and where they come from. Here's something interesting. Dietary supplements are not recommended for cancer prevention. Now this upsets a lot of people. First, because there are papers that indicate that supplements on anti-cancer agents have a benefit in cancer prevention or cancer risk reduction. 
and uh, also because this has become a huge business. Now you can find nowadays um, almost anything in supplement against cancer. This goes from shark, uh, ale, uh, or to, I don't know, but you can find almost anything as supplements against cancer. Now the conclusion of this study, this meta-analysis, is that supplement don't do really the job, that it is much better to eat fruit, uh, to eat uh, food as a whole. And there's evidence for it. Now Dr. Edmonds, tomatoes and broccoli. This study just simply tells us that the synergy between the food that we take and the anti-cancer element that are in them do better than if we take these anti-cancer agents alone. You know that the, one of the elements, only one of the elements, anti-cancer elements that are contained in tomato is lycopene. Now he did a very simple study. He, he took, uh, I think it would, uh, I don't remember, rats, rats or mice with prostate cancer. And he gave them, like Betty Vo, his uh, vegetable cocktail. And he, 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 it came out that giving them uh, only tomatoes or only broccoli, which are foods that are proven having a high anti-cancer uh, agent, amount of agents in, in them, were, was less efficient than giving them together, and was even less efficient uh, than giving them the supplement. This means taking out the anti-cancer agents and giving them directly uh, uh, as intake. So this is evidence for preferring food, real food, to supplements. Now this might not be true for vitamin D. And you know that vitamin D is a problem in supplement. Now, cancer specialists, medical and surgical, do pay a lot of atten uh, attention now to vitamin D. And we found even around the Mediterranean Sea, where there's a lot of sun, that we find people that are struck with cancer with a real low vitamin level, vitamin D level, and we don't know really why. Now another recommendation is for breastfeeding, we're not gonna into this, this is another topic. But what is interesting, and this was the bottom line, is that cancer survivors really do benefit by applying these recommendations after they have been diagnosed, treated, and survived cancer. So there's a real impact. Power to reduce not only the cancer risk, the original cancer risk, but also the relapse and the re-cancer risk. And this is good news. David, let me give you the time to tell us how you do practically. 